All glory and honor to God. How many of you believe God can do it again? Amen. Praise God. It's the same as today, today and forever. <clears throat> I really thank God for the wonderful privilege God has given us to come together once again into God's house and worship the Lord freely. In fact, nobody expected that the churches will be open so soon, but God did it. Amen. It's very, very important for God's people these days to come into God's house for the spiritual growth. Amen. Our only desire that we should all grow and conform to the image of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and be prepared for His soon coming. Absolutely, we have no other desire. Amen. Only one desire to become more like the Lord Jesus. And to be prepared for his soon coming. Amen. God's word is infallible. God's word is immutable. God's word has got power and life. To change our lives. If you trust God's word. And if you live accordingly. The same God. The same word that changes your lives. Can also change your circumstances. Amen. I believe. Today's message. Will really. Rush. You know. Revolutionize your life. Change your life. Because God's word has got the power to. Transform us. Amen. So I would encourage each one of you to listen to God's word. Prayerfully this morning. The title for this morning's message is. The Lord's doing. The Lord's doing. We are people who love the word of God. Church, it is the word of God that causes us to live. Please don't forget. It is God's word that causes us to live. That's the reason the Lord Jesus Christ said, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen. We live by the word of God. Amen. Will you turn the Bible this morning to Psalm 118? And I would request you to kindly involve yourself in this time of listening to God's word. You know, God expects active listening, not passive listening. There's a difference. Active listening. Involve yourself as you listen to God's word. Apply it then and then to your lives. See it with your own eyes. See the scriptures with your own eyes. Amen. So that God's word can bring immense blessing to your lives. Psalm 118. Let's read verse 23. Psalm 118. And let's read verse 23. Look at your Bibles. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Shall we read this verse together? Come on. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Amen. Usually where do you see this verse? Come on. The wedding invitations. This is a very familiar text in the whole Bible. Often we see it inscribed in the wedding invitation cards. Many Christians use this verse in the wedding invitation cards <coughs> because they do not know the background of this verse. I hope at least you will not do this mistake after listening to this message. Amen. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. What David is talking about. When he says this is the Lord's doing. What is he talking about? We need to read the previous verse. To understand what David means by saying. This is the Lord's doing. See the previous verse. Verse 22. The stone. Which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner this is what God did 
And David says, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. The stone which the builders rejected is become the headstone of the corner. So when Christians use verse 23, this is the Lord's doing, it's marvelous in our eyes, in the invitation, wedding invitation cards. They only say that this boy or this girl was like a rejected stone and so and so this poor person is marrying him. I hope you understand what I mean. See, that's why we got to be very, very careful when we use God's word. We have to first of all understand the context or the background of that verse before we use God's word. Today we are going to study Psalm 118. And we are going to understand the background of this verse 23. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. If you study Hebrew, you will know the background of this verse. People who study Hebrew will very well know the background of this verse. If you understand the background of this verse, then you can understand the marvelous works of God. And you will also know that God can do the same thing in your life. Now Psalm 118 is the central chapter of the whole Bible. Make a note of it somewhere. Psalm 118 is the central chapter of the whole Bible. Now if you consider our translated Bibles, then the people will say Psalm 117 is the central chapter of the whole Bible. But if you take the original Hebrew leather parchment scroll, then Psalm 118 is the central chapter of the whole Bible. So this chapter 118, Psalm 118, is very, very important in the Bible. Certain things happen in the land of Israel. I'm going to tell you a story this morning. How many of you interested in stories? Amen. Along with the stories, you will also get the truth. Because we don't just speak stories in the church. Amen. Certain things happen in the land of Israel. They are history and nobody can deny it. In the land of Israel, there is a very famous village called Bethlehem. The Hebrew word Bethlehem means house of bread. In Hebrew, Beth means house, Legem means bread. Bethlehem means house of bread. We know the Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the living bread. Because the Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the living bread, he was born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. Amen. Where was living bread born? In the house of bread, Bethlehem. In this land of Bethlehem, there was a man called Jesse. He was a very rich, influential man in Israel. Who was this Jesse? David's father. David's father. Not only that. He was the grandson of Boaz. We know the history from the book of Ruth. We all know Boaz married Ruth, the Moabite's widow. A son was born to Boaz and Ruth. What was his name? Very good, Obed. And Obed begat Jesse. Then who was Jesse? The grandson of Boaz. Now we know that Boaz was a very rich man. And Jesse was the rightful heir of the entire world of Boaz. Amen. And that's why he said Jesse was a well-reputed, well-known, renowned man in the land of Israel. Even King Saul knew Jesse very well. He was such an influential man. Now turn your Bibles. 
to 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 12. 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 12. I'm reading it from the NIV version. Now David was the son of an Ephratite named Jesse who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons and in Saul's time Jesse was a very old man. Jesse was a very old man. He was highly regarded and respected in the land of Israel. Now follow me carefully. Jesse had seven sons. Am I right? Okay. You may say, Bible says eight sons. How come you say seven sons? I will come to the eight son a little later. How the eight son was born is a matter we are going to study today. In Hebrew, number eight is very important. Number eight stands for new beginning. Remember, number eight stands for new beginning. You know why? The first day of the week is also the eighth day of the week in the Hebrew calendar. The first day of the week is also the eighth day of the week in the Hebrew calendar. And therefore, eighth day is the beginning of the week. That's why number eight stands for new beginning, a new life. Just keep it at the back part of your mind. Now Jesse had eight sons and everything went on well. But all of a sudden, a great tempest arose in the life of Jesse. In Israel, this Jesse was the head of the Sanhedrin. In those days, Sanhedrin was the council of judges. This is recorded in the Hebrew literatures and also the biblical reference book called Jaser. Amen. This man, Jesse, was the head of the Sanhedrin. He had position, he had wealth, he had reputation, he had power, he had honor. Now, all of a sudden, a great storm arose in his life. Now, the important members of the Sanhedrin, which we call it as Beth Din in Hebrew, they raised a question against this man called Jesse. You know what they said? Jesse, your grandfather Boaz married a woman. Who was she? Ruth. And Ruth was not a Jew. Ruth was not an Israelite. She was a Moabite widow. She was a Gentile. Now they said unto Jesse, your grandfather Boaz married a Gentile woman and you were born as a descendant of a Gentile woman, Moabite woman. Your father Obed was born to a Gentile woman, Ruth. In that case, how can you be an Israelite? How can you be a Jew? We have our own doubts on your Jewish citizenship. Now when your Jewish citizenship is questionable, how can you continue as the head of the Sanhedrin? You cannot be the head of the Sanhedrin. On that basis, they removed Jesse from his position. If they had stopped with that, no problem. They called Jesse's wife. Anybody know her name? It's not in the Bible. Nitzoveth. Jesse's wife, David's mother. Nitzoveth. They called Nitzoveth, Jesse's wife. She was a Jew. She already had seven sons. Now the Sanhedrin called Nitzabeth and said unto her, We have doubt about the Jewish citizenship of your husband. You are a Jewish woman. And as a Jew, 
you cannot live anymore with a non-Jew. So they said, you have to be separated from your husband, Jesse. By this, the society separated Jesse and his wife, Nitzavath. It was a great humiliation to Jesse. He wanted to somehow establish his Jewish citizenship and regain his position in the Sanhedrin. Now this man began to think. And Jesse planned a cunning scheme. Follow me very carefully. I'm talking history. Biblical history. Now this man Jesse planned a cunning scheme. You know what he did? He called the servant of his wife Nitzavet. She was a Canaanite born woman. And he said to her. Listen. I am going to marry you the second time in the place of my wife who is separated from me. He called the servant of his wife Nisaret and said to her, I am going to marry you the second time in the place of my wife who is separated from me. Now in Israel, no one should marry a Canaanite bond woman. But Jesse said, I'm going to marry you. And I also know this will become a great problem in Israel. Everyone will question me saying, how can you marry a Canaanite bond woman? Then, according to the Mosaic law, I will give you a letter of divorcement and send you away. By this, you will also be released from your slavery. You can become free. And this whole land of Israel will come to know that now I am living according to the Mosaic law. And the elders of the land will say, we told Jesse to send away the woman, now we have sent her away. And therefore he is now living according to Mosaic law. So we can consider him again, reinstating him, restoring him, into the Sanhedrin. Hope you follow me. Like this, Jesse wanted to pretend as if he was following the Mosaic law. When this Canaanite bond woman heard this from Jesse, she went straight away to Nisabeth, Jesse's wife, and told the whole story. Now Nisabeth told the servant not to disclose this matter to anybody. Now listen, this is something important. On the very same night in which her husband Jesse going to marry this bond woman, Nitzavet disguised herself like that bond woman and Jesse's wife came unto Jesse. Now according to the Jewish customs, they will marry only the night time. We know this from the parable of the ten virgins. Jesse's wife already had seven sons. Now she disguised herself as a bond woman. And on the day of the wedding, they will cover the face with a veil. So no one will know who is that woman. That's why Jacob had problem to know whether she was Rachel or Leah. Now Nitzavet, the wife of Jesse, covered herself with a veil and comes in like the bond woman to her own husband. That's how the wife of Jesse, Nitzavet, became the mother of the eighth born son, David. Are you able to follow me? Now, there was a great commotion and confusion in the whole land of Israel about this family. Now the question arose, how can the wife of Jesse become pregnant when she is separated from her husband? So they said, she must have lived an immoral life. Therefore, according to the Jewish law, she must be stoned to death. Now she was brought before the Sanhedrin. They said, you have sinned against the Lord. 
We all know that you are separated from your husband, Jesse. And now you are pregnant. You have to be stoned to death. So Nitzavet, in order to just save a life, she disclosed, she disclosed the whole story to the Sanhedrin. Now listen, what Nitzavet did was right in a way, but it was also wrong because she got a child from her own husband without the knowledge of her own husband. That's why this eight born son David, when he wrote Psalm 51 much later, he says in verse 5, Psalm 51 verse 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. This is the background of that verse. She was in a way right, but at the same time she was wrong because she got a child from her own husband without the knowledge of her husband. That's why David says, in sin did my mother conceive me. Hope you understand the background of that verse. Now listen. Now this whole family matter was exposed to the Sanhedrin council. Terrible humiliation for Jesse. You know what Jesse did? He stood up in the council of the Sanhedrin before the members. He said, I already have seven sons. Now my wife has become the mother of the eighth child. But I am not going to accept this child which is going to be born as my child. Please follow me. Something very important. Jesse openly declaring to the Sanhedrin. The child which is going to be born the eighth born, I am not going to consider the child as my child. I am not going to give this child Jewish citizenship. I am not going to give this child my inheritance. I am going to bring up this child as a slave. I am going to bring up this child like a Gentile. And this eighth born child will not be an heir to my inheritance. As far as I am concerned, this eighth born child will be a Gentile to me. My house shall be built only by my seven sons born to me. This eighth born son will be like a rejected stone in my family. Now listen, this child is not yet born. The child is still in his mother's womb. Even while the child was in his mother's womb, this child was rejected by his own father. Church, can you imagine? This child was a thrown away child from the womb of his mother. That's why David says in Psalm 22 and verse 10, look at your Bibles. See what David says. Psalm 22 verse 10. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Are you able to see that verse? Psalm 22 verse 10. Just imagine the heart, the state of his mind when David wrote this psalm. He says, I was cast upon thee, O Lord, from the womb. Thou art my God from a mother's belly. If you read some scholarly English translations like YLT, Young's Literal Translations, David says, Upon thee, O Lord, I have been cast. Upon thee, O Lord, I have been cast from a mother's womb. From the belly of my mother, you are my God. Thou art my God. In other words, Upon thee, I have been thrown away from the womb of my mother. Church, I want you to just picture this scene. 
His father, Jesse, threw him away even while the child was in his mother's womb. In many respects, this eighth born son was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. As people criticize about the birth of the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, many people in the land also criticize the birth of David. This eighth born son faced similar criticism, what the Lord Jesus Christ faced. Now the child was born. His father saw this child as a slave. His father saw this child as a Gentile. Right from his childhood days, this child suffered so much. In Israel, a slave will be treated worse than a dog. Jews will treat the Gentiles like a dog. Now according to the Jewish customs, Mothers cannot do anything on their own without the permission of the father. According to the law, the father will have the sole authority in the family. If the father says something, that's final. Wives, they must obey. According to Jewish customs, wives should act the way the husband does. Because the father rejected this child, his mother was also forced, compelled to reject the eighth born son. Imagine the state of David. See what David says in Psalm 27 and verse 10. Look at your Bibles. Psalm 27 verse 10. It's heart moving. Psalm 27 verse 10. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Amen. In our translations, they said, when my father, or if my father, but in the original it is not so. If you read NASB translation, David says, for my mother, for my father and my mother have forsaken me. They have forsaken me. But the Lord will take me up. If you refer to the Amplified Bible, it's beautiful. Amplified Bible. David says, although my father and my mother have abandoned me, yet the Lord will adopt me as his own child. Amen. Now the Hebrew word used there is, Yas Peni. The root word used there is hasaf, which means adopt. He says, my father and my mother literally rejected me. But my God had adopted me as his own child. Can you imagine being forsaken by his own father? Father forsook him. Because of the torture of the father, mother also, she had to forsake him. Not only that, his seven elder brothers hated him to the core. Do you know what David says? Turn the Bibles. Psalm 69 and verse 8. Psalm 69 and verse 8. I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. Do you see that in the Bible? Imagine the heart of David. I am become a stranger. Psalm 69 verse 8. I become a stranger unto my brethren. And an alien unto my mother's children. His own brothers. His own father's children. His own mother's children. Look David as a stranger. You know what David saying? I was born from the same womb which brought forth my brothers. Now listen. David's brothers were not like the brothers of Joseph. In both the cases, you know, David was hated by his brothers and Joseph was also hated by his brothers. But there is a difference. 
At least in the case of Joseph, his brothers were not born to the same mothers. Amen. Joseph's brothers were born to different mothers. But in the case of David, his brothers were born from the same womb of his mother. David says, they see me as a stranger. They see me as an alien. They see me as a Gentile. They see me as a slave. Sister, brother, is there anybody in this congregation who have experienced this in your life? Have you ever experienced your own brother, your own sister, treating you as a stranger? Yes, you do. That's why the Holy Spirit of God speaking these words to some of you this morning. David says, my own blood, born in my own family, treating me as a stranger. If an outsider treat me like this, I will not mind. But my own family, my own brothers, treating me as a stranger. I'm not able to bear it. But this is what said about the Lord Jesus Christ also. That's the reason I told you the eighth born son is a type of the Lord Jesus. What does the Bible say about the Lord Jesus? He came unto his own, and his own received him not. What do we read in Isaiah 53? He's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with griefs. Oh, church, others cannot understand this experience. Only those who have gone through can understand what I'm talking this morning. This was the experience of this young man, David. Rejected in his life. Rejected by his own family. Now it's not an ordinary thing to be a slave in Israel. Do you know how they will treat a slave in Israel? The household, the family, the household will eat fast. Then the men servants will eat. Then the maid servants will eat. Only after that, the slaves will be allowed to eat the leftovers. Now think of David. He was considered to be a slave in the family. For every square meal, this young boy, he had to wait for everyone else to eat fast. On many occasions. The feast will go on inside the house, but the slave must stand outside the house. As I told you earlier, Jesse's family was a very rich family in Israel, but David cannot enjoy anything. Usually, the last child will be pampered. Am I right? Amen. Amen will be loved very much. But this eighth son in this family was a rejected child. Think of this. How David should have been. He should have been the darling son in the family. Being the last child of the house. But he couldn't enjoy anything. Think of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the darling son of God the father. But when he came down to this earth. He was a man of sorrows. That's the reason I told you the eighth son is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever happened to the Lord Jesus Christ also happened in the life of this eighth born son, David. Now think of the brothers of David. If they want to help him, they could have helped him. If they want to, they can help him, but they will not. Is there anybody who has experienced that? There are people who can help you. If people cannot help you, that's okay. We understand. But there are people in the family, they can help you, but they will not. They will not. Is there anyone who has experienced that? Imagine when the feast is going on inside the house, the slave boy has to stand outside and just see the meeting. How painful it is. You know what it says in Psalm 69 and verse 22? Psalm 69 
And verse 22, let the table become a snare before them. Let the table become a snare before them. Inside the house, feast is going on. But this David was driven to the wilderness with few sheep, starving without food. We very easily think, oh, God blessed him and made him a king over Israel. But no one knows the path he went through. Amen. Now, do you know the job his father gave him? What was that job? To tend few sheep in the wilderness. Imagine there were so many servants in the house. There were so many men servants and maid servants in the house. Jesse could have sent one of his servants to take care of the sheep. But he sent the eighth born. He sent all the other sons. Eliab. Abinadab. Shammah. He sent all of them to the royal palace of Saul. To work in the army. But the eighth born son was sent to the wilderness to take care of the few sheep. Not only that Jewish rabbi, they say, his father Jesse will send David to dangerous wilderness, not to ordinary wilderness, to dangerous wilderness infested with lions and bears. Why? Because Jesse didn't want this child to be alive anymore. You know what Jesse said? Let this child be killed by wild animals. If this child dies, at least the reproach that has come upon me will be rolled away. Imagine. Church, imagine. See what David says in Psalm 69 verse 21. Psalm 69 verse 21. They gave me also gold for my meat. And in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Imagine. David's experience. They gave me also gall for my meat. And in my thirst gave me vinegar to drink. You know what is the background? When this young boy comes back from the wilderness tending the sheep. Every day the family people, the members will find some fault with this young boy and they will give him punishments. In Israel, if they want to punish a slave, you know what they will do? They will mix gall. It's, it's a kind of plant. Leaves. They will mix that leaves in the food the slaves eat. Immediately, the whole food will become bitter. And they will also mix vinegar in the water they drink. Jewish rabbi, the tradition says, many, many nights, David will roll on the bed with terrible, excruciating stomach pain and he will cry throughout the night because of this gall mixed with his food and vinegar in his water. He says, I have drenched my bed with tears at night. Sister, brother, the hope of a man is in his family. A man can go through any amount of trouble, but the only hope that man has is his own family. But this young man was hated, despised in his own family. So all his hopes were shattered. Because his family treated him as a slave, other people in the land also started to treat him with contempt. Do you know what David says? Look at the Bibles. Psalm 69 and verse 20. Psalm 69 verse 20. Reproach hath broken my heart. Reproach hath broken my heart. I am full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. For comforters, but I found none. Verse 12. Look at the Bible, verse 12. They that sit in the gate 
speak against me and I was a song of the drunkards. Even those people who sit at the gates of Bethlehem just to please Jesse, they spoke ill of David. Because the way he was treated in his own family, even other people in the land spoke ill of him. Amen. Spoke very bad of this young boy, David. There was no one to inquire about him. There was no one to speak peaceably unto him. No one to comfort him. No one to encourage him. David says, I was looking for somebody to take pity on me, but I found none. Sister, brother, is there anybody who feels that you have gone through this path? This was the situation of David. Is there any time in your life you were frantically looking for somebody to take pity on you, to encourage you, to speak peaceably, to speak words of comfort, but you find no one? I believe David would have pleaded with other people to speak to his father on his behalf because for no reason or rhyme his father ate him to the core for no fault of his. Amen. I believe he, he would have gone to the elders and said, please, uncle, please speak to my father. Every time he sees me, he's He's hating me. I don't know the reason. I have not done any fault. But nobody came forward to speak on his behalf. To make the matter worse, the whole land of Bethlehem considered David as a thief. Can you imagine? The whole land of Bethlehem considered David as a thief. See what David says in Psalm 69 and verse 4. Psalm 69 and verse 4. They that ate me without the cause are more than hairs on my head. They that would destroy me, being mine enemies wrongfully, are mighty. Now notice this, last part of it. Then I restored that which I took not away. Underline this in your Bible. I restored. I gave back that which I did not take. I had to give, you know, which I have not taken. Do you know what he means? If someone, if someone's sheep lost in Bethlehem, if someone's sheep lost in Bethlehem, they will straight away put the blame on whom? On David. They will say, you have stolen my sheep. You have to give back to us. Falsely accused many a time. David would try to prove his integrity and honesty. And he would say, no, I didn't take it. Please don't put the blame on me. I didn't even see it. But they'll say, no, no, you're the one. You have to give it back. Now David, he had to give a sheep which he had not taken away. Now, if he goes home that day with one sheep less, what will happen? Again, they will mix gall with his food and vinegar in his water. Same thing said about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus was numbered one among the transgressors. He was numbered one among the thieves. Gall and vinegar was given to him. Amen. David is a type. Now if in Israel, if they want to curse somebody, follow me. In Israel, if they want to curse somebody, they will say, you shall become like David. David became a byword. The wall of Israel considered eighth born son as a curse. The same thing happened to the Lord Jesus Christ. What does the Bible say? He became curse for us. Amen. Now if you read the book of Jaser, you will understand. Follow me now. You will understand at times, at times, his mother, Nisabeth, will call his son, David, secretly 
and encourage him saying, don't worry my son, I am also not able to help you in any way and you know about your father. I want to help you, I want to do something, but I am not in a position to help you in any way. Therefore, my son, please hold on to God. Hold on to God. Father doesn't want to help you. And I am in a position not able to help you. Please, my son, hold on to God. One day, God will lift you up. One day, God will exalt you. Church, can you imagine his own mother not able to speak to her own son openly and freely? Can you imagine this eight born son not able to speak to his mother freely? Now, there was one relative of David, his auntie's son, whose name was Joab. He was the one who had seen David right from his childhood days. Follow me. Joab had seen the life of David right from his childhood days. You know what he says? Follow me. 2 Samuel chapter 19 and verse 7. 2 Samuel chapter 19 and verse 7. Now therefore arise, go forth and speak comfortably unto thy servants. For I swear by the Lord, if thou go not forth, there will not tarry one with thee this night. Now, now notice the last part of it. See what Joab says to David. Last part. And that will be worse unto thee than all the evil that befell thee from the youth until now. Have you noticed the last part of that verse? And that will be worse unto thee than all the evil that befell thee from the youth until now. Now my question is, why should evil befall David right from his childhood days? Jesse was a rich man in Israel, born as a descendant of Boaz. Jesse inherited the wealth of Boaz and all the wealth should have been equally shared among eight sons in his family. And why should this eight born son experience evil one after the other right from his childhood days? Church, this is the background of Psalm 118. How many of you understand me? This is the background of Psalm 118. As the first initial days, as the first initial years of the Lord Jesus Christ, are hidden records in the Bible, follow me, as those initial years of the Lord Jesus Christ, they are the hidden records of the Bible, David's initial years also, they are hidden records in the Bible. We can understand what happened to David from the Psalms he had written. Amen. No hope at all. Because his father Jesse was a very influential man, Nobody could help come forward to help this David. No possibility for David to come up in life. I would rather say David was at the height of rejection. Now listen, there's a turning point. Now comes the intervention of God. God has been watching. This young boy, right from his childhood days. Because his mother had told him, David, it's true we have forsaken you. It's true your father hates you to the core. But hold on to your God. Hold on to your God. Because his mother said it again and again. This thought has been just printed in his heart's table indelibly. And this young boy, eight born son, held on to his God for everything. Even if he had to be in the wilderness in a very dangerous place, where there are lions and bears, this young boy would worship God, sing unto the Lord. He'll say, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Forget not all his benefits. Praise God. 
the young man developed a very intimate relationship with the Lord. Despite ever so many evil that befell him, ever so many affliction that he faced, this young boy held on to his God. Therefore, a time came, God started to work for this young boy. Amen. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, one event, one event took place in Bethlehem. Now you've got to turn the pages of your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. It's an exciting passage of scripture. 1 Samuel chapter 16. I'm reading verses 1 to 3. Follow me. 1 Samuel chapter 16 verses 1 to 3. And the Lord said unto Samuel... How long will thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take an eye with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. Verse 3. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. Underline that part of it. Thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. Amen. God said to Samuel, Go to Bethlehem, for I have chosen one of the sons of Jesse, and I want you to anoint unto me the one whom I name. Anoint unto me. For me. For me. Now listen church. Now listen. This young man was rejected by his own father. But here the Lord says, he is for me. This young man forsaken by his mother. But he is for whom? For the Lord. The young man. Forsaken by his own brothers. But he is for whom? For the Lord. The Lord God who created the heaven and earth. Says anoint. This man for me. He is for me. His own family forsook him. The whole Israel. Saw him as a curse. But God sees him and says. You are for me. Hallelujah. Imagine David at the time was in the height of his rejection. To him the Lord says, You are for me. Sister, brother, you may probably say this morning, I don't know to whom God is speaking, that somebody in this congregation, you may probably say, I don't know why my own people hate me. I don't know why my own people despise me, forsake me, avoid me, ignore me. I don't know why I am rejected in the society, or probably in your workplace, or in your own home. Do you know why? Do you know why? There is a reason for this. If the people around you, if your own family hate you. There is a reason. You know why? The reason is the heaven has approved you. Amen. Amen. If you feel that you have been ignored, avoided, the reason is the heaven has recognized you. Church, do you know something? Only from rejection, God's recognition begins. If God has a plan to recognize a man, he or she will be rejected, will be forsaken by men. The Lord Jesus Christ was rejected by men, but approved of by God the Father. If man rejects you, it means God hath approved you. Somebody shout Amen. amen. If people ignore you, if your own family reject you, it means the seal of heaven is upon you. Don't get discouraged. 
Don't be disheartened if you are rejected by people. The Lord says today, you are for me. Rejected by his father, by his mother, by his brothers. People in Bethlehem saw him as a curse. The people of the land considered him as a thief. To him the Lord says, you are for me. Why people avoid you? It means God has approved you, my brother. Heaven has planned something great for you. Rejection will come. Rejection must come. But don't be disheartened. God says, my child, you are for me. Because the seal of heaven is upon your life, you will be rejected by people around you. Now go on, keep reading. See verse 4. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 4. 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 4. And Samuel did that which the Lord spoke and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Come as thou peacefully. Come as thou peaceably. Now we know that Samuel was a great prophet of the whole land of Israel. Now Samuel had sent a message saying, I am coming to Bethlehem to offer a sacrifice unto the Lord. And he called the family of Jesse to the sacrifice. Now listen to me carefully. Samuel comes. Along with Samuel, the family of Heron also comes. The priests, the Levites, they come along with him. In Israel after a long time, a feast of sacrifice is being organized. All the important and renowned men of Israel are gathered there that day for the sacrifice. Listen, listen very carefully. Listen very carefully. Don't miss it. What God is trying to say to you this morning. As Samuel came, how did the elders of Bethlehem face Samuel? With trembling. They could not face Samuel with joy, but with fear. What is the reason? What is the reason? The reason is Samuel calling the family of Jesse to the sacrifice. So they thought that Samuel was coming to Bethlehem to inquire about the matters that happened in the house of Jesse. So they asked Samuel, Come as thou peaceably. What did Samuel say? Verse 5. First Samuel 16, 5. And he said peaceably, I come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourself and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. First of all, Samuel asked the people in the town to sanctify themselves. And secondly, Samuel sanctified Jesse and his sons for the sacrifice. Now keep reading. Verse 6. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab. Samuel looked on Eliab, the eldest son of Jesse, and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Now we think of this. Now listen, listen to me. Samuel was there. The family of Heron was there. The priests and the Levites gathered together, renowned men of Israel, the elders of Bethlehem, now the family of Jesse. Now Samuel asked Jesse to bring all his sons, you know, by the order of the birth. Now all his sons come before Samuel one by one. First of all, Eliab, the eldest son, comes before Samuel. Samuel looked on Eliab, the elder son of Jesse. Now, the name Eliab means, Hebrew students will know, El means what? Eli means what? My God. Ab means what? Father. So what is Eliab? My God is a father. It's my father. My God is my father. So Eliab's name, God is my, 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 my God is my father. Looks so spiritual. This man Eliab was so gigantic, handsome, 
well built. Immediately, Samuel started to think in a natural way and said to himself, surely he is the Lord's anointed. But what did the Lord say? Look at the Bible, verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance, not on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For a man looketh at the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh at the heart. Now see verse 8, what happened? Then Jesse called Abinadab, the second son, and made him to pass before Samuel. Abinadab. Come on, Hebrew students. Hab means what? Hab means what? Habi means what? Nadab means what? Wow. Wow. Nadab means V O W. Wow. So Abinadab means wow of my father. Wow of my father. Abinadab was very close to his father's heart because he was a very obedient child to his father and his father loved him so much but the Lord did not choose him either. Amen. Abinadab was rejected. Now see verse 9. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by. Shammah in Hebrew means astonishment because this man Shammah was multi-talented man. His life was real astonishment. Neither had the Lord chosen him. He was also rejected. Now come on to verse 10. Verse 10. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. Look at the Bible, verse 11. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? Because I have come to anoint one of your sons. Are here all thy children? And Jesse said, listen. Jesse said, there remaineth yet the youngest. And where is he? Behold, come on. He keepeth the sheep. Now think of this. Samuel the prophet of Israel had come to Bethlehem. All the priests and Levites have come along with him. All the elders of Bethlehem. I've come together. The family of Jesse is there. A great piece of sacrifice is going on. Listen to me. An invitation had gone to everyone. An invitation had been given to everyone in the land. But to the eighth born son, invitation was not given. When invitation was given to everybody in the land, Invitation was not given willfully to the eighth born son. Why? He was considered to be a stranger. He was considered to be a Gentile. I want to ask you this morning. Was not David worthy at least to come there and eat a square meal? At least he could have come and taken his food as a slave along with other slaves. But the hatred was so much on David that his father didn't want this boy to come to the feast. But rather, willfully sent him to the wilderness that day to take care of the sheep. Have you experienced this in your life? Is there anybody? Imagine you are very close to a family. A family function is going to be conducted in that family but Although you are very close, you are ignored. All are invited, but you are not invited. Is there anybody? I don't know to whom God is speaking. Amen. Very close to the family, but you are ignored. All are invited. Even distant relatives are invited. You are not ignored. You are ignored. You are totally forgotten. Do you know what happened? Church, do you know what happened? Look at the Bible, verse 7, the second part of it. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 11, the second part. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him. Underline it in the Bible. Send and fetch him. For we will not sit down till he come either. Now listen. 
Father did not invite him. Mother did not invite him. His brothers did not invite him. The people of the land did not invite him. But God invited him. Hallelujah. Ignored by his own family. Despised by his own family. Forgotten by his own family. God had not forgotten him. Invitation did not come from his family. Invitation came from heaven. How many of you know God is speaking to you? Amen. If you feel that you are being ignored. If you feel that you are being forgotten by your own people. Don't worry says the Lord. People, your own people may forget you. But I will never forget you. People may ignore you. They may not invite you. They may not even recognize you. But you are important to me. Says the Lord. You may be unimportant, insignificant to your own family, but the Lord says, you are precious in my sight. Amen. Simon now says, only if he comes, I will continue the feast. He is the man of the match. <laughs> David who was rejected by all Israel, but now God says, he should be the chief guest in this feast. Amen. I want to tell you this morning, church, don't expect honor from people. The Lord will honor you. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Somebody shout Amen. amen. This is the background of that verse. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. A time will come. The Lord will stand on your behalf. With holy zeal. And all the eyes will see. That. Hallelujah. The Lord is for you. All the eyes will see in amazement. And they will shout and say. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Amen. When, Samuel's, when, Jesse, when Samuel said to Jesse, send and fetch him. I imagine, this is a piece of my imagination. Jesse would have said unto Samuel, he's a little fellow, you know. He must be tending his sheep somewhere in the wilderness. We don't know where he will be at this time. We cannot search for him now. It's already late. It's getting late. Come on, you better continue. So let's proceed. Samuel would have said, nothing doing. <laughs> Send and fetch him. Amen. Bring him here. What does the Bible say in verse 12? And Jesse sent and brought him in. Sent, sent, Jesse sent and brought him in. I believe the whole land of Bethlehem went in search for this young boy, eight born son. Because Samuel said, ye must come. All those who avoided him, rejected him, despised him, I believe would have run elder and skelter to search for this eight born son. This is the Lord's doing. Amen. I prophesy in the name of the Lord and I don't know to whom God is speaking. Listen. Those who avoid you, those who ignore you, a day will come, they will come in search of you. Amen. It will happen, brother. Sister, if it will happen, if God says something, it will happen. Those who avoid you, those who ignore you, they will come in search of you. Your circumstance will change. Now, they all went in search of David. They found him in the wilderness. When they found David, they would have said, David, your father is calling you, man. David said, my father calling me? No chance, no way. 
He has never done that before. I had never heard my father calling me at any time. Amen. They said, no, really. Your father is calling. Not only your father. Great prophet of Israel wants you there. He is waiting for you. Only if you come, they can offer the sacrifice. Everything is on the standstill. They have stopped the feast. They have stopped the sacrifice. They are just waiting for you. A time will come. God will make you indispensable in the family. Amen. Hallelujah. The feast was going on, but Samuel said, No, I cannot continue the feast anymore. I'm stopping here. He must come. Everything is on the standstill. What does it mean? God making this eighth born son indispensable. Amen. I don't know to whom God is speaking. The Lord says, A time will come those people who ignored you, avoided you, will know that you are indispensable. God will make you indispensable. A time will come that without you, nothing can happen. God will not allow things to happen without you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now David is brought. See, look at the Bible verse 12. Now he was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Arise, anoint him, for this is he. You were all there. The priests and the Levites, renowned men of Israel, elders of Bethlehem, the family of Jesse were all there being sanctified. Now listen to me, something very important. Without sanctification, nobody can come to offer sacrifice unto the Lord. Therefore Samuel said to the elders of Bethlehem, sanctify yourself and come along with me to the sacrifice. And Samuel sanctified Jesse and his sons. Am I right? We read it. So the elders of Bethlehem sanctified. Jesse was sanctified. All his sons were sanctified. But David, listen, are you listening? Now David, directly coming from the wilderness with his dirty work clothes. Not sanctified by anybody. Why? He is already a sanctified vessel. God himself had sanctified him. If God had sanctified a man, who can condemn him? Hallelujah. What did Balaam say to Balak? Balak wanted Balaam to curse God's people, but what did he say? How shall I curse whom God had not cursed? How can I defy whom God hath not defied? Amen. Now the Lord said unto Samuel, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. It seems as if God himself was so very excited. <laughs> See in a crowd when somebody is, you know, being searched, if that person is very much needed and that person is not there, and all of a sudden when that person is found, Hey, hey he's here, man. He's here. Have you heard it? That's what God says. When David walks in, all the eyes were focused on David. The, the Levites, the priests, the elders of Israel, all the elders of Bethlehem, even the family of Jesse, all the eyes were focused on the eight born son. David walks in as a shepherd boy. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Arise, anoint him. This is he. What did Samuel said little, little earlier in verse 11? For we will not sit down till he come either. Verse 11. For we will not sit down till he come either. But now what does God say? Arise and anoint him. What happened in between? David's coming was delayed. And Samuel became tired and he sat down. The point I like to drive in the hearts. 
When God makes you significant, you will not be available immediately. Follow me. People will wander, 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 searching for you. You will not be easily available. Are you able to follow me? They were searching all over, searching all over, running here and there, wandering in search of David. Probably that would have taken a long time. Now God brings David in his own time. By the time Samuel became tired and he sat down. And the Lord says, my elect has come. Stand up and anoint him. Even prophet Samuel had to stand and anoint this young boy. Can you see the way God honoring a man? Amazing church. If you read this verse in the Hebrew, you will be amazed. When God told Samuel to arise and anoint David, God was not standing with Samuel and saying, anoint him. But God was standing with David and telling Samuel to anoint him. Are you able to follow me? That's how it is in the Hebrew. Are you able to follow me? When God said to Samuel, arise and anoint him, God was not standing with Samuel. God was standing with David and telling Samuel to anoint him who is with me. Amen. If people reject you, forsake you, despise you, it means the Lord is standing with you. If God is for you, what man can do unto you? If God is for you, who can be against you? Look at the Bible, verse 13. First Samuel 16, 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of his brethren. In the midst of his brethren who rejected him, the Lord anointed him. It was at that time David wrote Psalm 118. Hallelujah. This is the background of Psalm 118. Now imagine how David would have written Psalm 118 with tears of joy, with gratitude, with jubilation. Hallelujah. David was writing this Psalm 118. Now with this background in mind, if you read Psalm 118, you will understand every verse clearly. We call the Lord Jesus as Christ. What is the meaning of Christ? Anointed, Mashiach, anointed one. Amen. Psalm 118 was written by David when he was anointed as a king over Israel. That's why God has kept this chapter as the central chapter of the whole Bible. Amen. Are you listening? Now, I've told you the background. I have finished my introduction. Are you ready for the message? Yes. Come on, are you ready for the message? Thank you. Turn your Bibles. Psalm 118. Psalm 118. You will enjoy it. Now you will enjoy reading Psalm 118 in a way that you had never enjoyed before. Psalm 118. I am reading from verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for He is good. Because his mercy endures forever. David talking about goodness in his own life. Verse 2. Let Israel now say that his mercy endureth forever. Because the whole Israel was present for the feast, for the sacrifice. Let Israel now say that his mercy endureth forever. Verse 3. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endureth forever. Now the priests and the Levites and the Aaron's family, they were all there in the feast. Now he is talking to them. Verse 4. Let them now that fear the Lord say that his mercy endureth for. These were the people who were born as slaves in the family of Jesse. Now verse 5. I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. Hallelujah. I called upon the Lord in distress. Now the Lord answered me and set me in a large place. What does it mean? David was only hated by the people of Bethlehem 
But God made him a king over the whole Israel. Can you see the enlarged place? How many of you can understand what I'm saying? Only the land of Bethlehem ate David. But God made David a king over the whole land of Israel. I want to say somebody this morning, if you are distressed in your life, then your next experience is in large place. Hallelujah. What does Psalmist say? In Psalm 66 verse 12, that was caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire, we went through water, but thou brought us out, out into a wealthy place. Amen. Amazing. Now read verse 6. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do unto me. The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. Now see verse 6, verse 8. Shall we read it together? Come on everybody. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. What is he? What is he saying? How many people, with how many people David would have pleaded to come and speak to his father on his behalf? Nobody came forward to speak. Therefore, now David writing from his own experience, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Hallelujah. I want to tell you this morning, sister, brother, never ever put your confidence, your trust in any man. Put your trust and confidence only upon the Lord who made you. Amen. Do you know something, by the way? Verse 8 of Psalm 118 is the central verse of the whole Bible. Amen. Amazing. And you see the word Lord in verse 8? How many of you see the word Lord in verse 8? That word Lord is the central word of the whole Bible. Psalm 118 is the central chapter of the whole Bible. Verse 8 is the central verse of the whole Bible. The word Lord is the central word of the whole Bible. Now look at the Bible, verse 10. All nations compass me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. They compass me about, yeah, they compass me about, but in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They compass me about like bees, they are quenched as a fire of thorns, for in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. Now he has been anointed as a king over Israel, but he had never put his confidence in his own strength but in the name of the Lord. If you read the three verses, again and again he says, in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah! No matter how, well, no matter how much God lifts you up, blesses you, never fail to put your trust in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah! Now see verse 13. Thou hast thrust sword at me that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. He was speaking to whom? He was speaking to his father Jesse. My father, thou hast thrust sore at me that I might fall. You thrust me sore that I might fall. But the Lord helped me. His father hated the eighth son, rejected him, threw him away, even while he was in his mother's womb. But the Lord helped him. Can I tell you something? If a man has refused to help you, it means the Lord hath already decided to help you. Amen. C14. The Lord is my strength and song and has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacle of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. Now the word valiantly in Hebrew, Chayil. Chayil. It means the Lord Himself will fight my battle. Let anyone come against me. I'm not going to be afraid because the Lord will fight my battle. 
verse 17 I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord come on everybody read it together I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord you know what David's saying because David was sent to the dangerous wilderness David thought the lions and the bears would kill him but what happened God gave him the needed strength and he rent those lions and bears as he would rent a kid who strengthened him the Lord strengthened him it's the Lord's doing amen verse 18 the Lord had chastened me sore but he had not given me over unto death this is David's ignorance God did not punish him but God was leading David through different experiences and equipping him to become the king over Israel verse 19 open to me the gates of righteousness I will go into them and I will praise the Lord he's talking about the tabernacle now now because David was considered to be a Gentile David was not allowed to come even near the tabernacle because he was a Gentile but now he says after being anointed as a king hallelujah he says the gates of righteousness are open verse 19 open to me the gates of righteousness I will go into them and I will praise the Lord now listen after being anointed as a king David expressing his first desire what was his first desire after becoming a king I must enter into the courts of the Lord and I want to praise the Lord hallelujah friend that is David that is David he was a man who loved God's house so much he was a man who loved God's presence so much therefore he says open to me the gates of righteousness I will <coughs> go into them and I will praise the Lord now listen I'm going to close listen to me after Samuel anointed David now they brought David to the temple on a donkey according to the law a king cannot be brought on a horse he had to be brought on a donkey now see what he says verse 20 this gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter I will praise thee for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation hallelujah father said Jesse said this this eighth son is, is a rejected stone. I see him as a Gentile. I see him as a slave. But see verse 22. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. Somebody shout amen. amen. Hallelujah. Jesse, his father, said this eighth child is like a rejected stone. But God made this rejected stone as a king over Israel. The rejected stone has become the headstone of the corner. How about to tell you church if people reject you? It means God sees you as the headstone of the corner. Now see verse 23, our key verse. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Lord's doing. How many of you can say this morning, this did not happen by any man. This did not even happen through Samuel. This did not happen because of Saul. This did not happen because of Jesse. Not by his mother Nisabeth. Not by money. Nobody else involved. It is only the Lord. It is the Lord's doing. Do you know what David is saying? For your joy. For the blessing. For the exaltation you are going to experience, no man can ever say, I am the reason for it. God will not allow that. Are you able to follow me? For your joy, for your blessing, for your exaltation, for your promotion, no one will be able to say, I did it for him. I am the reason for it. No, God is not going to allow that to happen. The Lord says, I will do it for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now verse 23, verse 23, hallelujah. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Who said it? 
Although David sang it, but who said it? David heard people there saying this. Who were all there? The priests, the Levites, the elders of Bethlehem, the renowned men of Israel, Jesse and his seven sons, and all the people, they shout together and said, This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. If David had said that, he would have written, Marvelous in my eyes. This is what not David said. The people around David. Verse 24. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Say now I beseech thee, O Lord, O God, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be ye that cometh in the name of the Lord. Do you remember this statement? Blessed be ye that cometh in the name of the Lord. O Santa, who said it? Oh, this was said unto the Lord Jesus Christ when he rode on a donkey into Jerusalem to go to the temple. Amen. Now this is rehearsed in the life of David. Now they have come to the temple. Verse 27. God is the Lord which hath showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords even into the horns of the altar. For all these many years, not a single sacrifice was offered for David because he was considered as a slave, Gentile. Jews will always offer sacrifice once a year for their sins. But all these many years, not a single sacrifice was offered to David because he was considered to be Gentile. But now he says, bind the sacrifice with cords, even under the horns of the altar. Hallelujah. Verse 28. Thou art my God, I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for his good, for his mercy endure it forever. Why don't we stand up to feet this morning? How am I really glad? Hallelujah. God of David is our God. I feel the wonderful presence of the Lord. Don't forget the central verse of the Bible. It is better to put your trust in the Lord than to put your trust in any man. Take a decision, church. Never, never, never at any time put your trust in man. Man will fail you desperately. Man will fail you miserably. But God is a faithful God. This is the Lord's doing. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. I prophesy in the name of the Lord. If you are faithful to the Lord, my brother, sister, if you are faithful to the Lord, in spite of so much of affliction that you go through right now in your life, if you decide and tell the Lord, Lord, whatever it may be, I will still love you. I will still remain faithful to you. Then, God will cause those people who rejected you, who despised you, who ignored you, to say, this is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. God will cause the people around you. You know what the people around you will say? Oh, God is with this man. Almighty God is with his sister. Almighty God is for this man. His God has done it for him. His God has done it for her. How many of you believe? How many of you believe? How many of you believe? This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Will you lift up your voice and thank and praise God? If God has spoken to you today, don't remain silent. Lift up your voice and thank God. What God de did for David, God can do it for you. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, I feel the mighty move of the Holy Spirit. I feel the wholesome presence of God. I see the hand of God set forth upon this congregation. Hallelujah. God is at work on your behalf. Oh, we worship you. Everybody open your mouth and hallelujah, offer praise unto the Lord. Hallelujah. 
Oh, we thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We praise you, God. We worship you, God. How many of you believe God can do it again? Brother, God can do it again. If God had done it for David, God praise can do it again. Yes, Sister, Lord. if God had done it for David, God can do it again. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, lift up your thank voice you, and thank the Lord. God. Hallelujah. There's no reason to doubt that my God can do it again. That's absolutely no reason to doubt, my brother. God is a faithful God. God is a faithful God. You may probably think that no one knows what you're going through. You may probably think that no one knows the affliction, the pain that you're going through. But the Lord says this morning, my child, I've seen your affliction. I have seen your broken heart. I've seen the pain that you are carrying in your life. I will do a miracle. I will change your circumstance. I will cause people around you to see that I am for you. And I am with you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your word. We are so thankful to you for your word. Because every time we come together, you speak to us, Lord. We thank you once again for your word. We pray that you will continue to speak your word to us. Even now, God, as your servants, we pronounce your blessing upon your people. Stretch forth your good hand upon every head bowed right now. Lord, bless them with good health and strength. Bless them with your peace and joy. Bless them, Lord, with your grace and mercy. And Father, bless them with your abiding presence. Prepare this small vineyard for your soon coming. Dismiss us now with the richness of your blessing, Father. All glory and honor be ascribed to thy holy name. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, the fellowship and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with each one of us this day till the Lord Jesus Christ comes. Amen. Amen.